Genesis 33 and verse 8. <clears throat> the title of this talk is The Journey of Grace. I'm hoping to bring out the truth that's in the Word of God that we, uh, we, we come to the Lord in repentance, we're baptized, as the Lord commands, we get filled with the Holy Spirit, we speak in tongues, and the power of the Lord comes to dwell within us. We become sons and daughters of God, all sin forgiven, and, uh, and the kingdom of God opens up for us. And it's by the grace of God that all of this takes place. If you look at, if, you, if you're reading the Amplified Version and you look up this word grace, it says things like His undeserved favor, His blessing. Start the clock. Oh, wait. There we go. Uh, blessing, favor, loving kindness, mercy. And so we come to where we are filled with the Holy Spirit. But really we spend our, our life growing in the Lord. That every day it's, a, it, it's an exciting day to live for the Lord. And to grow that much more each day. To grow to understand that His grace is there to, to uphold us. To surround us. To comfort us. To guide us. To lead us. And, and to cheer us. To everything. God's grace is, is right there to help us. But we grow to understand this more and more as we, as we walk on in the Lord. And, and it's been more than 30 years that I've been in the Lord and I, I still feel like I've just barely scratched the surface of the power of the Lord's grace and how amazing he wants to be towards us and how much He loves us, how much He cares about us on a daily basis. And here in Genesis 33, verse 8, this is the time when Jacob is returning uh, back to the land where he was brought up, I believe, and he's, he's, he's facing his brother Esau. In the past, he deceived es Esau to, to steal the birthright or to take the birthright. Um, not necessarily stolen. It was it was it was ordained by God for him to have the birthright, but he decided perhaps God's timetable was too slow for him, so he wanted to speed things up, and he he tricked his brother Esau and and went down the road of deception, and he paid for it too. But he's coming back into the land where where he was brought up, that area. And he's about to face his brother Esau, and he's not sure what's going to happen. He's thinking, okay, is he going to kill me? And um, is this my last day? And he's, he's there with his wives and his family. And so, we're just going to pick it up in verse 8. It says, And he said, What meanest thou by all this drove which I met? This is Esau saying to Jacob, What's all this, uh, what's this, what is this big group before you? And he had prepared a present for Esau to help him see that, hey, I want to make peace here. I don't want you to kill me. And uh, I want to be friends. And he said, these are to find grace in the sight of my Lord. So you can see that Jacob is calling Esau Lord. And, um, and he, he's prepared this gift. And he's desiring grace from Esau. He's desiring grace favor and kindness from Esau to forgive him of the deception that has happened in the past and to put that behind him and to help him see that, that Jacob didn't want any animosity between them. He wanted friendship. Verse 9. And Esau said, I have enough, my brother. Keep that thou hast unto thyself. Jacob said, Nay, I pray thee. Now, if if now I have found grace in thy sight, then receive my present at my hand. For therefore I have seen thy face as though I had seen the face of God, and thou wast pleased with me. So he's really uh, taking a, 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 a humble position before his brother. But notice this phrase, If now I found grace in your eyes, Please accept my gift 
accept my, and perhaps in the gift was also an apology. I'm sorry for how I treated you in the past. And uh, let's forgive all that. Let's be brothers together. But he's seeking grace in his eyes. And this phrase, if I have found grace in thine eyes, if you look it up, is mentioned many times in the Bible. And, and so I wanted to bring out this idea, this truth that we've come to the Lord and we have found grace in His eyes, in God's eyes. And the Lord's grace is much more powerful than, than man could ever show grace to another man. His grace is so powerful, it is able to cleanse us of all sin by filling us with the Holy Spirit and making us sons and daughters of God. But we have come to the Lord and found this grace. And I suppose also in this story you see that, that even on a natural level for people that are desiring grace between each other, forgiveness and favor and kindness to be shown, there has to be give and take. There has to be some humility shown as, as Jacob's doing. He's saying, hey, look, here's this big present, and I'm so sorry. Um, please, you are like God to me. I heard buttering him up, I guess. And um, I'm, I'm sure Jacob didn't think he was God, but he's saying, you are like God. You're, you're, so, you're so amazing. You're, you're a great brother type of thing. But you can see in that there's humility, there's Jacob's doing something to obtain this grace from his brother. And we can compare this to our lives where we hear the gospel and we hear the truth that Jesus came to this earth, he died for us, rose again, he's seated at the right hand of God. He, he wants to save us and wants to fill us with the Holy Spirit. And when we heard that, we realized God was inviting us into his grace and we had to do something. Just like Jacob realized he had to do something to show his brother that he's sorry by bringing this gift. And we bring ourselves to the Lord. We, we bring ourselves humble. We bring ourselves repentant. And showing the Lord that we want to obey Him and follow Him and, and surrender our whole life to Him. And so grace... Kindness, favor, unmerited blessing. I suppose we can, when we think of the word grace, we can just think of, oh, well, God's really kind. And He is. But it's so much more than that. It's His kindness brings an amazing reaction from the Father, from God, towards us. Just like in our in our day-to-day -day relationships, relationships one with another. If we're to show grace to one another, that grace isn't just a word. That grace comes with action. It comes with, it comes with apology if there's, if there's animosity. It comes with love if there's, if there's going to be any growth in a friendship. And, and, and this is how God's grace comes to us but in a, in a much more powerful way than we could ever experience between a, a human relationship. And so let's follow that theme through. Let's go to Ephesians 1, please. In Ephesians, we're going to see some descriptions of God's grace. And they're, they're descriptions that, that make you just stop and go, Oh, wow. That's, I need to think about this, as you'll see here. So I hope you have that reaction. Verse 3, chapter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who hath blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. All spiritual blessing. You have to, when you read that, just stop and tell yourself, the Lord's given me everything. I don't lack a single thing. This is grace. This is part of His favor, part of His kindness. According as He has chosen us in Him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before Him in love. 
having predestinated us under the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to the good pleasure of his will. So we're adopted. He's planned this long before we were ever born, he saw us. Verse 6, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Just an amazing little one line there. Praise of the glory, the glory, the wonder, the splendor, the magnificence of his grace. He's done all of this to wake us up and to help us see the amazing glory of his grace. Wherein he's made us accepted in the beloved. He doesn't reject us. He loves us. If our faith and our heart attitude is towards the Lord, he's, his attitude is, I want to show you my grace. I want to show you my grace. And I want you to have an appreciation in your heart that makes you think of my grace as, as glorious and amazing. I was having some prayer recently and, and praying in the Spirit and tongues. And I wasn't pr praying for all that long. And, and I just stood up and was just, just feeling the peace the Lord gives you after a time of prayer. It doesn't necessarily happen like this every time when I pray. But it does a lot. And it's just, does this, just like this peace that comes, that comes over me. And, I'm, and I was standing there just thinking, this just feels so amazing. Lord, you're incredible. And... All I did was have prayer. I just prayed in time. Which is powerful. It's not just all I did, right? It's powerful to pray. But His grace is such that He wants this relationship with us. He wants us to experience His peace in the midst of the storms that we go through. And some storms are very difficult, as, as our sister was saying. But though the storms can be hard, and we're in this warfare, as we heard in the gifts... There's a battle going on and there's, there's forces of evil that come against us daily that we can't even see with our mind. But we know it's true, it's in the Word. The Lord's there with His grace to uphold us and to help us just have this feeling of, wow, Lord, You're amazing. So verse 7. In whom we have redemption, He's paid a price to set us free. Through His blood... The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. And again, another phrase just amplifying this, this amazing truth, this word grace. We're saying amazing grace. And it, it is so amazing that, that if people, we see people come to the Lord, baptism, get filled with the Spirit, they turned away from their old way of life. But they don't last long, perhaps, and they, and they leave. And part of the reason why they leave is they have not understood the power and the riches and the glory of God's grace. If they knew that, they would see that, that there is nothing out there in this world that could take the place of God. And they'd stay. And they'd grow and they'd, they'd push through whatever difficulty they were going through that was trying to challenge them to leave. And they'd seek for wisdom and understanding because God's grace is so incredible that He wants us to be amazed and so in love with Him. Um, yes, okay, let's go to John, oh wait, chap chapter 2 there. In Ephesians. Skip down to verse 4. For God who is rich in His mercy, for His great love wherewith He loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ, by grace are you saved. By grace we've been made alive, set free, He's rich in mercy. All of the letters, you might recall, as you read all the letters in the New Testament to the churches, most of them start with grace and peace to you at Ephesus, to you at Philippi, to you at Thessalonica. And, he, and he's, he's desiring this grace and peace. And it's, 
it, it shows that grace comes with peace. In some of the letters, it, it, it adds mercy in as well. It says grace, peace, mercy. This is what the Lord wants us to experience. By grace you are saved. It doesn't just mean when Jesus comes back, that word saved. That, that's definitely a part of it. But it's, it's also right now. The word saved means to be healed, delivered, protected, rescued, preserved. And so if we're experiencing any kind of uh, touch from the Lord, blessing, deliverance, wisdom, whatever, that's a part of God saving you. He's rescuing you from from some thought pattern that's that's making us doubt or making us have unbelief or, or making us turn away in some way. The Lord is intervening to save. He sees us in a situation and He touches us by His grace to save. Praise the Lord. Go now to John 1. The example of grace and the fullness of grace we're going to see is all in Jesus Christ. John 1 verse 14. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. We beheld His glory. The glory is of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. This is Jesus. If we want to understand grace, we look at Jesus Christ. We look at His life. Because His life is the picture of, of what grace means. Every word He said, every action He did was all a demonstration of His Father, of His grace. And he's, and not just, it doesn't say um, uh, the only begotten of the Father with grace and truth. It was full of. This is the Lord. Full of. We're going through a day that's difficult and one of those days where everything doesn't work out right and everything you touch seems to break. I know we have some of those days sometimes. We have a God who's full of grace that comes and surrounds us and says, I'm right here. It's okay. Though everything's breaking, I'm here. I'll help you. I'll help you have peace. I'll help you rejoice. I'll help you not worry about whatever it is. Verse 16. And of His fullness, so of His fullness, which is full of grace and truth, we have all received. And grace for grace When you read that in the Amplified Version, it gives you the the word picture of grace upon grace upon grace just keeps coming. Like a person who, who, who loves to give you gifts, who loves to pour out favor upon you. This is our God. And yes, so grace upon grace. Go to Romans 5, please. So, this truth is so much more than a word. So much more than, oh, I know Jesus loves me. I know He cares about me. He gave me the Holy Spirit. And now that's true. Absolutely. But He gave us the Holy Spirit so that on a second-by-second basis, we would be surrounded by the knowledge of His presence dwelling inside of us, helping us to hold steadfast to His ways. And that brings a whole different dimension to just just this word being His kindness. We have to allow that kindness and the meaning and the truth of that kindness to come right within our very heart, our very being, and and to be reflected. And it's all by deciding to have faith in our Lord, as we'll see here. Romans 5, verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justified means to be declared righteous. You are righteous in God's sight. Declared righteous, justified, all sin forgiven. Before you came to the Lord today, all sin forgiven. If our attitude is, Lord, my faith is in you. Verse 2. By whom, I mean by Jesus Christ, also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand 
and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. So how do we position ourselves to receive more and more of His grace and to understand it more and more? It's simply just have faith, which is trust, which is confidence, which is just desire in our heart. And we're all, we're, we're, we're all so different. We're all at, at such a different level and, and uh, not necessarily even level is the right word, just at a different, the Lord comes to each one of us on each of our level. And, and we're all so precious and unique in the sight of God. He cares so much about us that He, he, he comes to us according to our personality, our, our likes, our dislikes. And, and He's got this special love for each one of, one of us. And He wants to deal with each of us in such a unique and true and, and amazing, wonderful way. And all we have to do is decide to put our trust, our confidence, and our love in Him. As it says here, we have access by faith. And so if we see ourselves in our mind, we're saying, Lord, I trust You. Then all of a sudden we've moved ourselves into position to receive His grace. Just by that desire. And it's not just a, we don't just say it by, like a parrot. We mean it. It's like when I was praying to receive the Holy Spirit. And they told me to say, hallelujah. And I thought that word was a big joke growing up because we, we joked around with friends at school about the TV preacher saying, Hallelujah! Right? And, and it was a big joke to me. And when he said that to me, I thought, oh, I'm going to say Hallelujah. <laughs> and, and I was even laughing in my heart. I remember I was sitting in the baptism tank saying, no, you're, you're not serious. <laughs> and, and I didn't receive right then. Two days later, praying by myself, I realized I've got to mean this word. I've got to mean praise be to God. And as I started to pray that and mean it and put the Lord above everything, then I positioned myself by faith to access His grace and to receive the Holy Ghost. I spoke in tongues. My life changed. And I felt this amazing peace. And so it's, it's that desire. Sometimes we can beat ourselves up and think, oh, I've got to do this in order to receive God's grace. I've got to pray, I've got to pray in tongues for an hour and read for two hours and witness to 20 people. All those are great. Do those things. But that's awesome. But, but we don't do it because we have to do it. We don't sort of make a, a, a law in our mind saying, this is what I've got to do to receive the grace of God. No, we do things for the Lord because we're in love with Him. Because we can. And, and we know what He's done for us. And, and we appreciate that more and more. So we do all the things we hear in the talks and, and gifts of, of prayer and reading and fellowship and all these things. Because we're excited to do it. We love to pray. Because the Lord answers with peace, with wisdom, with direction. We love fellowship because in fellowship we learn and we grow and, and we come because we want to. Yes, there is a, a have to aspect to it, but it's, it's out of love. It's God isn't forcing us to come. He isn't forcing us to pray. He, he desires us to do it out of, out of our own free will to love Him as any relationship would uh, would require. So go skip over to verse 17. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, speaking of Adam, much more they which receive abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Abundance of grace. Reign in life. Your kings and priests reign. We have authority. Authority from God to reign in this life over situations that come our way. Even tragedy that comes our way. We have authority to stand in His grace and in His peace. So amazing. Let's go to Acts 4. When you look up this word grace, it comes from the Greek word charis. 
and and it talks about God's divine influence upon our heart if you're reading it in the Strong's and so you get this picture of the Lord miraculously influencing our heart our mind our soul our thinking uh, uh, all of our desire but then there's an amazing little little part that's added when you read it in the Strong's it says and God's influence upon our heart is reflected in our life. I thought, wow, that's, that's amazing. It made me think about how if you go to, uh, you, you picture one of those scenes you've gone to, gone to perhaps up Yosemite area or some river, and, and you're looking at it, and you see a mountain scene, river, or maybe a lake. I'll make it a lake. Lake in front, in front of you, and the mountain's reflected in, in the lake, and it looks amazing. You're like, whoa, you can hear the wind blowing, birds. Eagle. And it looks really cool, really amazing. But what you're seeing is this reflection, and it's like, wow. And so when you think of grace, and you think of God's Word, and we're looking into this Word, the Word of God is the reflection of our Father, the, relex- the reflection of God Almighty. And we're filled with the Holy Ghost. And the Lord wants to influence our heart. He wants to have His way. But in order to do that, we've got to, we've got to surrender, right? We've got to say, okay, Lord, I surrender. I surrender everything. I surrender my will, my anger, my jealousy, whatever, right? Anything that could come in our way, the, that list in um, Galatians about the, the ways of the flesh. We surrender all of that. And then all of a sudden, reflected in our life is the character and the glory of the grace of God. And so if we can see in our life, and if we see this reflection, and we desire it to happen, we desire His grace to shine through, His love, His kindness, His favor, and and we're reflecting it out to others. And maybe some days we do good at that, and some days we don't do as well. That's all right. Just grow. Grow in that. Grow to desire this reflection process to take place in our lives. It talks about holy influence upon our our soul to bring strength and increase and knowledge and affection towards the things of God. And I think if you stop and you think about ways in your life that you're allowing this reflection to take place, just allowing the the character and the nature of God to to be displayed in your life. Be excited about that. Even if it's just in a few small areas. And maybe you've got a lot to reflect on in other areas. Well, praise the Lord. So do we all. Right? We're, we're all growing. But be excited that you're allowing His grace to flow through you as we reach brothers and sisters. We reach this world with the gospel. In Acts 4, I think I told you to go there. And I'm not there. Acts 4. For the sake of time, I'm going to skip through a little, little bit. Verse 33 of Acts 4. Um, it says, And great power gave the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And great grace was upon them all. When you read the story, they, they were going out, they were preaching the Word of God, filled with the Holy Ghost, seeing mighty miracles happen, and just being bold for the things of God, and desiring the Word to go out. These are ways that we allow the power of the grace of God to flow through us, as we're reaching out in our own special way to this world around us. And great grace will be upon us and is upon us as we gather this morning. Go to chapter 11. Barnabas comes to a place where the saints are rejoicing. I think it's Antioch. Yeah, Antioch. And in verse 23, Barnabas comes and it says, Who when he came, Barnabas came, and had seen the grace of God. 
was glad and exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave unto the Lord. I thought that that's uh, amazing there because it shows that grace isn't just a, a word that we rejoice in, as I've said. It's something that must be seen. Again, this, this idea of reflection. How can you reflect this grace? Let it be a challenge to each one of us to think of ways that I can reflect grace. Maybe there's, there's, there's someone in our life that, that we see we could show a little bit more grace to. And, and or, or whatever. There's ways. We, there's many ways I think we can think of how I can show the grace of God to people around me. Barnabas came to, the, to Antioch and he saw the grace of God. He was excited. Like, whoa, praise the Lord. These people are rejoicing. Keep going. Have that purpose of heart to seek the Lord. Cleave to Him. He saw the grace of God. Let people see the grace of God in you. Even if it's in a simple thank you, right? Thanks for what you're doing. A simple just showing appreciation in our homes and love and kindness. Telling your friends the gospel. And on and on. You can think of many ways. You can't think of any prayer. Pray about it. And all of a sudden, the Lord will just start filling your mind with ways to show grace. <clears throat> I was listening to one of those Revival on the Air podcasts. And they, were, they were interviewing, he was interviewing Pastor Sammy from Africa. Somewhere in Africa. I forget where. Kenya or something. Oh, well, thank you. Yeah, Kenya. <clears throat> and um, he was talking about how when he first came to the Lord, he, was, he wasn't even six, six months old in the Lord. And some of the pastors said, Sammy, you've got to go back to your vid- village and, and live there and preach the gospel there. And he said, like, no way, I'm not going back there. Because he was used to living in the city and the city life. And, and he knew going back to the village would be a rural, rough life. And... But he really prayed about it and thought about it and he realized he had to do it. And he went back and the first day they were there, it was like 54 people were filled with the Spirit in a very short time. It might, have been, might not have been the first day. But he realized, and he probably wasn't thinking it along this line, so i got to share the grace of God because he was really young in the Lord. But he, he came to the point where he realized, Lord, I'm willing to die for you. I'm willing to lay down my life. If I go back to my village and they shoot me with an arrow and I die, I'm willing to do it for you, Lord. I'm willing to give up my career in the city. At first he was thinking, oh, no, you know what I'll do? I'll work in the city and I'll support a pastor in my village. And he realized, no, I can't do that. i got to go back. And think of ways to challenge yourself, even in small areas. Start small. To show the grace of God. Start small and then and then grow. Grow in different ways. Have fun with it. And see the Lord work in amazing ways. <clears throat> 2 Timothy 2. <coughs> 2 Timothy chapter 2. So I'm trying to bring out that, that grace is more than just this, this word about His kindness. It's a word and a truth that we have to bring into our life and become the grace of God. The scriptures say that that our word should be seasoned with grace. It says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it might minister grace to the hearers. We are ministers of grace, which is the gospel which is our life lived. Our life lived shows our faith. It shows where we are in our, in our walk with Him. And I don't say that to put any one of us down. It's, it's a challenge. I want my life lived to show the grace of God. Even if I fall, I want to get up and show that grace. Praise the Lord. So 2 Timothy 2 verse 1, Thou therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Again, you see it's, it's putting this word grace to, to action and life. Be strong in the grace of God. 
<clears throat> Go to Galatians 5. Galatians 5 and I read verse 1. Stand fast therefore in the liberty wherewith Christ has made us free and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Craig sent that out this morning. Liberty. Freedom. So this truth of grace is, is not a, oh I've got to show grace to people around me. Oh, I don't feel very gracious to that person, right? It's not that. There's a liberty to this grace. There's a, I'm going to show them grace over time and see what happens. I'm going to see them change. If it's someone who's not saved, perhaps they'll come to the Lord. If it's a, a relationship between a brother and sister, that relationship will get better, all the people say. There's, you know, there's no ifs or buts. That relationship will get better. If it's a family member, we, if we decide to be the stronger one in the situation and show grace, that relationship will get better. And it's like you can, we can trust this truth that God's grace will flow and move in any situation. And it's almost like we can have an attitude like sort of watching a movie, seeing the scenes take place. All right, I'm going to show grace to this person and watch what happens. And watch God just move and mold and change. And work his power. So liberty. This is I'm I'm talking about a, a freedom the Lord calls us to, his grace to enjoy. <clears throat> Verse four Christ has become of no effect unto you, whosoever you are who are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. So the saints at Galatia. They had brought themselves back under following the law, thinking that this is how they can please God. And Paul was saying, no, that's, that's not how you do it. God's called you to freedom. You've got to walk away from, from your old ways of being under the law and bring yourself under Jesus Christ, under His grace. And I wanted to read this here to say that it's possible to fall from grace. It's possible to bring ourselves under a type of bondage where, where we don't want anything to do with the grace of God or we're refusing to stand in this freedom that the Lord has called us to and to, to just love His grace and the, the possibilities are to fall from it. So we don't go that way, which is the way of, of sort of trying to follow the Lord and, and, but you know your heart's not in it. You know you're not really wanting to. It's, we've got to follow the Lord, spirit, soul, and body. Mind, soul, and spirit, Jesus spoke of. <clears throat> Go to 2 Peter, chapter 1. These are amazing verses. I won't get through all of them. But 2 Peter 1 is a, a great, how to grow in the Lord chapter. 2 Peter 1, verse 2. Grace and peace be multiplied. That's pretty cool. Multiplied. Any relationship that has to that that's gonna gonna grow, grace and peace is gonna be a, a part of that relationship on a natural level. How much more is it gonna be real with God and us? <laughs> grace and peace be multiplied. He doesn't just say grace and peace be to you. It's multiply. The Lord's desire multiply to you. Through the knowledge of God and of Jesus, our Lord. So we spoke about how it's by faith we have access into His grace. Deciding, choosing. It's also by knowledge, by knowing. Where is the knowledge going to come from? Through the Word. Through testimonies we hear, through prayer, through the knowledge of God and of Jesus our Lord. Verse 3, according as His divine power has given unto us all things, all things that pertain unto life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him 
that has called us to glory and virtue through knowledge. When you read these verses, it, it should make you think, wow, I, I just want to fill my mind with knowing Him, with getting to know Him more and more through listening to His Word, through prayer, through, through learning from our testimonies, just so many ways. And this is how grace and peace is multiplied towards us. So the next time you're sitting down reading, reading, reading the Word, allow yourself to think, wow, I'm, I'm, getting, to, I'm getting to know my Lord more. Which means grace and peace it's going to be multiplied more towards me as the Lord helps me to understand who I am as a son, daughter of God. And as the Lord helps me to see my, my daily situation through His eyes, grace and peace is going to be multiplied. Wow, that's awesome. So with this kind of an attitude, so I'm going to read a little bit more, right? If you're used to five minutes, go ten or more, right? Challenge, grow. Praise the Lord. Go to James chapter 4. James 4, verse 6. Oh wait, sorry. Yep, verse 6. Humble yourself therefore under the mighty hand of God that He may exalt you in due time. That's, sorry, that's verse 6. I was supposed to read the verse before it. Uh, yes. Verse 5. Likewise, ye younger, submit yourselves unto the elder. Yea, all of you be subject one to another. Be clothed with humility. For God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Another avenue to understand is grace. Humble. It's a, uh, you, know, you know, I really just blew it right now. I, I, I didn't really blow it here. <laughs> it's like in our lives, right? Say we blow it. And it's saying, you know, I really blew it right now. That's humble. It's like, I'm sorry. It, sometimes that's a really hard word to say, I'm sorry, because you might not feel very sorry because you realize you just blew it. And we're just coming out in the open and, and apologizing to someone or allowing someone to go first. That type of thing. Putting someone before ourselves. This is, this is how we get access into understanding and enjoying the grace of God. It's another person is more important than ourselves. And let's go to Hebrews 4. Another great verse speaking about uh, God's grace. I didn't read in, just as you're going to Hebrews 4, verse 15. I didn't read in 2 Corinthians 12, it says, My grace is sufficient for thee. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Amazing. God's grace is sufficient. Power of Christ rests upon us. We are weak. And we need the Lord so much. People that leave, they don't know how weak they are. And how much they need God's grace and power to uphold them. The power of Christ will rest upon us. As we realize that in our weakness, we're tremendously strong if we admit it and submit to our Lord. So Hebrews 4 Verse 15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities. It was all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. This is Jesus. He knows exactly what we're going through, no matter what it is. He knows what it feels like to experience the temptation that we go through. He is our high priest who loves each one of us so much. And He desires us to, to be experiencing His amazing grace as we sang every day. 
So knowing this truth, we go to verse 16. Let us therefore come boldly under the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Coming boldly is like, here I am, Lord. I'm here. Maybe, maybe, it's, maybe it's something we've, we've got something we need to change in our life, in our, in our walk. We've got to change an attitude or whatever. It's, Lord, I come. Here I am. This has to change. This situation has to change. And I'm coming boldly with thanksgiving. Thank you, Lord, you understand it. Thank you, Father, you're here. You care, you love me. And I don't doubt your love in any way, shape, or form. I'm here, believing, expecting, standing. And th this verse shows, you will find grace to help in that time of need. And you'll find it in such an amazing way, you'll want to tell someone about it. You want to tell a brother or sister. You want to tell someone you're working with how amazing God's grace is and how He's changed you. So I, the journey of grace, let the journey go on. Let it go on today and tomorrow to understand more and more His grace in our lives so that we can help each other, so that we can help people out there in the world See that the Lord's grace is so, so incredible. It's, it's, it's like the ocean, right? Filled with so much wonder. You, you can't ever stop exploring it. Let's never stop. Let's never stop exploring and wanting to grow in His grace. All the people say. Amen. Amen. Okay, we'll leave it there. Praise the Lord. We're going to sing a hymn at this